The facilitator for the panel discussion on neurotrauma research is Roger Chung, Professor of Neuroscience at the Australian School of Advanced Medicine at Macquarie University. He is also the chair of Brain Injury Australia. So I'll hand it over to Roger. Roger. We'll test if this works. Um, thank you, Nick. So it's a great pleasure to chair this panel discussion. Um, I'm following Nick's instructions. <laughs> so if you don't like the format, blame Nick. <laughs> what he's asked me to do is to, um, to ask the presenters to give a short presentation each, and then we'll have a, a facilitated panel discussion at the end, um, as I think you can see from your program. Um, we're really looking here at the very start of the journey, so looking at the acute end of a traumatic brain injury. And we're very grateful here to have four um, national experts who are going to tell us about some of their research on this particular topic. So we're starting with Professor Alistair Nicholl um, from University College Dublin and the Australian and New Zealand Intensive Care Research Centre at Monash University. Thank you, Alistair. So thanks to Nick as the organising committee for the invitation. See how this goes? Hey. Um, so, look, delighted to be here, and really, as Roger said there, this is the point the end. Um, I'm also an intensive care clinician in the Alfred Hospital. So, unfortunately, on my day-to-day -day job, when I meet people, a lot of the accidents that were described earlier on in the talks today have already occurred. So, we have to help the patients and their families put together not only what has just happened, but what is going to happen in the acute care setting and beyond. And it was very useful today to see the, the, the total breadth of research going on well beyond. But my, re, my research and what I'm going to talk about today is going to concentrate on that very pointy end in the intensive care unit. So I'm going to talk about EPO, which is erythropoietin, which is a hormone which has got a lot of bad press because it's helped some sports people. Uh, have an unfair advantage. And what I'm going to discuss today is a program of research where we think it might give patients with TBI an advantage as well. The, my disclosures are that we have got governmental funding to support this work, and we also got uh, funding from the Government of Ireland. Um, but also, I'm here to talk on behalf of many, many people. We have a research centre in Monash and a clinical trials group which has made trauma and TBI a priority for over a decade. And I stand here on their shoulders and with particularly Ronaldo Bolomo, Craig French and Jamie Cooper have led this research over the last decade. So it was noticed over 100 years ago that if you were at high altitudes or you were hypoxic, you had more red cells. And over the next 100 years, we actually developed, it was a glycoprotein hormone called erythropoietin or EPO that caused the red blood cells to go up. And about 30 years ago now, it was, uh, there was a human recombinant form so this could be given as a drug. And this slide represents patients who had end-stage kidney disease. Let's see if this works. And basically, they needed to get red blood cell transfusions regularly to keep their hemoglobin up. And then, if you started to give them erythropoietin, so human recombinant erythropoietin, their red cells just rose. So this was the erythropoietic effect of erythropoietin. So that is all great. So the EPO binds to its receptor, and the red blood cells go up. But that was only our initial rudimentary understanding. We now understand that actually um, it's a pleiotrophic cytokine, which basically means it does all, lots of other neat things that we did not anticipate at that time. And it's these other neat things that are particularly relevant in trauma. Because, sure, having increased red blood cells is really useful in the ICU. And as I'll talk about, that's why some of the initial studies were done but it's the other effects that can be really, really useful in trauma. And as Lindy sort of elucidated in her talk, it's not only the primary injury, it's the secondary injury. It is the area around the primary injury where you get this sort of cascade of oxidative stress, cytokines and inflammation. And a little bit of inflammation can be good, but too much can be bad. And it appears that erythropoietin just helps tilt that balance. And actually, if we give exogenous erythropoietin, so erythropoietin as a drug administered after trauma, it can maybe tilt that balance by reducing the inflammation and also having protective effects. It's just a slide of a rat brain, oops, after a 
deliberately induced stroke by ligating a vessel. And what we see here is no erythropoietin, and you have that big penumbra of injury. And here, in the presence of erythropoietin, it's less. So it's just a visual representation how in a rat model of stroke that erythropoietin may be beneficial. And actually, we've started to see in lots of other tissues around the body that these erythropoietin receptors are not just in the bone marrow to make more red cells, they're in lots of different organs. And these are organs that are particularly important to be repaired if you've had brain injury and had trauma. So to go to the clinical studies, so this is called a Fars plat, and essentially what it does is it, oh, I can only work the slides. Uh, the study, the people who got erythropoietin, the people who did not, and the size of the box represents the amount of people in the study, and the lines either side are basically the confidence intervals, so how sure you are of your result. And if we look at clinical studies, so these are people who were sick in the intensive care who got erythropoietin or got a placebo. And the reason intensive care doctors did this at the start was we thought it would be useful to have more red cells if you were sick with trauma in the ICU. But it turns out that, there, that the protective effect we see here is independent of the effect on erythropoiesis. So it's not a red cell effect. It's the other effects I talked about. So putting this all together, that suggests that there's a 95% chance that erythropoietin might reduce mortality in severely ill trauma patients by about 20%. To talk about one of those studies, so uh, it was published in 2015. We did a large study of 606 patients with severe and moderate traumatic brain injury. Half of them got erythropoietin in the ICU for three weeks, and half of them got just um, the control, so placebo. What we demonstrated was erythropoietin did significantly reduce mortality. But we used this score as well, it's called a GOSE. So um, it did not increase the amount of survivors with favorable outcomes. So while it reduced death, it did not increase the proportion of patients who had favorable neurological outcomes. So we were sort of, yeah, awesome. I was getting a high five there. <laughs> uh, that happens a lot. Um, so well, one size didn't fit all. So the question was, are there particular groups that may get more benefit than others? So are there, are there particular groups of patients we should look at more closely with this treatment? So we looked at neurosurgical group and a non-neurosurgical group. So in the simplest way, a neurosurgeon will go, is there something that's taking up a lot of space that I can remove? Yes or no? And the answer is, well, if there is, it's generally a big blood clot. So we divided the patients who had... Um, a, who were probably unconscious because they had a big clot versus the patients who were probably unconscious because they had diffuse brain injury. And what this suggested was that if you had the diffuse brain injury, that the erythropoietin was much more likely to be beneficial, so much more likely to improve survival. We also looked at patients with major trauma. So this is the consort diagram. So the 606 people and roughly 300 in each group. So this ISS over six, that is a measure of major other trauma, so major trauma outside of the head. And what we find is, well, nearly 50% of the patients in our study had other multi-trauma. So when we looked at the cohort divided into two groups, so the patients who had an ISS under six, so mainly brain injury without major other significant trauma, April didn't have a big effect. But when we looked at the group with the ISS over six, so a moderate and severe traumatic brain injury with major trauma, again, we, we saw a protective effect of the erythropoietin. So this made us think that actually erythropoietin may be a drug in the future that actually might be able to improve outcomes in patients with major trauma. So this led to our study, which is the EPO trauma study. And that's what we aim to test. We want to resolve the clinical uncertainty so the doctors at the bedside know, should I give my patients EPO or not? Some American doctors say we should just do it anyway. The Australian community doesn't use it regularly. We are currently unsure. So this trauma will resolve that uncertainty. Should uh, patients who have had major trauma in ICU get erythropoietin or not? Unfortunately, to get into the study, you've had to have a major trauma, be unconscious, and be on mechanical ventilation in the ICU. So that person and their family has had a pretty disastrous day that day for the patients to be entered into our study. And as an aside, we're doing studies 
to look at patients when they survive, views of the study and their relatives of the consent process and how we talk to um, patients' families at these times as well. The trial is just really simple. For uh, Within the first 24 hours, the patient will get erythropoietin that day and a week later, if they're still in the intensive care, versus they'll get some saline. And these are just as little injections just under the skin, like insulin is given. So if erythropoietin turns out to be beneficial, it's a very, very simple intervention in the ICU. We're going to measure, um, the outcome is, can we, um, can we affect the proportion of patients who have death and severe disability after uh, major trauma and being admitted to ICU with erythropoietin? Yes or no? We have lots of other secondary outcomes looking at length of stay, quality of life, lots of other metrics, and health economic evaluation at the end. It'll be a large study involving all of the trauma centres in Australia and New Zealand, and it will also extend into Europe as well. We plan to enroll 2,500 patients over five years, and we hope to demonstrate a 6% reduction in mortality and severe disability six months after injury. So either way, the study will resolve the uncertainty regarding erythropoietin and major trauma. And thank you for listening today. Thank you for all of the speakers. And thank you for the patients who participated in the study. Is he going to flip my slides over? Good. Thank you very much for the invitation to present our, our work and what we do up in the far north. Um, you coming down to do that? Or? Yeah, good. So I'll just, I'll just give my introduction that while this, my slides are being switched. Um, so my name is Geoffrey Dobson. I'm a scientist, uh, and uh, I'm giving a. We're in two parts. I'm giving the hemorrhage TBI, and uh, Haley Letson is giving the, the, the TBI data. Uh, we work for the. Uh, we, we're funded by the U.S. Special Operations um, uh, out of uh, Tampa, Florida, and uh, these these medicos they uh, they just have a backpack um, uh, with their medical supplies. They go far forward. And we're developing uh, low cube weight uh, uh, solution, um, drugs combination of adenosine, lidocaine, magnesium uh, for hemorrhage and hemorrhage plus TBI or TBI alone. And so we are cooking with gas. So I was trained at Monash University. I went overseas to uh, Vancouver, Canada. I did a PhD in uh, exercise physiology. Then I went to NIH where. I studied uh, mitochondrial bioenergetics for an, in the heart for about uh, 10 years, and then I came back. I, I didn't like the four seasons in one day in Melbourne, and I went up to the north where I am in Townsville ever since. So my philosophy of research is, for, is the August Crow principle, and that is for any question in science, there's one animal best suited to study it. So um, what I'm going to do is talk about uh, the drug that I developed from an idea from natural hibernators. And uh, the drug is uh, adenosine and lidocaine magnesium. You all know them. But uh, these are old drugs. But I'm going to tell you how we taught them uh, new tricks for hemorrhage and uh, TBI. So um, I'll talk about the, uh, the idea of the first application to trauma. Uh, translation to the pig and our task by the US military to get it out into the field by 2026. So um, the idea was could, we, could I make the human heart first of all um, operate like the pharmacologically change it and operate like the heart of a natural hibernating animal for cardiac surgery. Cardiac surgery they use high potassium to arrest the heart, they do the surgery and, uh, and uh, that's very unnatural and it can be uh, and cause problems. So these little, these little hummingbirds, which was my model, they have a heart rate of uh, 1,500 beats per minute, and if it gets cold or food availability gets low, they'll drop their metabolism by 98% and just a, a, a beat of about four or five beats per minute. So um, they, they, uh, the hibernator's heart doesn't alter its membrane potential, and that's very interesting, doesn't alter its membrane potential while it does its arrest, and that's how I came up with the idea of using that uh, for, for, the, uh, for the drug development with ALM. So what I did, the, the, uh, the human heart from the atria all the way to the ventricle is made up of these amplitudes and, uh, and um, durations. They're all electrical impulses, and if you add all them up from the atria to the ventricle, it's ECG. So my idea was to knock out the, uh, the amplitude, and I used a drug, lidocaine, sodium fast channel blocker, and adenosine as a, as a uh, sodium channel uh, opener, 
uh, sorry, a potassium channel opener. I, I used that, and when I did that, I went home to my wife and said, I think I've discovered something quite interesting. You can put the heart to sleep, it stays there for six hours, no troponin release, and uh, it's, it's quite fascinating. We added magnesium to stabilise the heart. So we used the cardioplegia for arrest, uh, and what I'm going to be talking about with our trauma is the non-arrest, so the way they use the low ALM to reanimate the heart after cardiac surgery. And uh, we are working with the US military for whole body arrest, new coma states and, uh, and alike. Two randomised trials have been done for the cardioplegia. It's been used in the States and Italy, not in Australia. So the, the second idea was when surgeons were reanimating the heart after, after complex surgery, what they would do is the low dose ALM. And that low dose, a, a, a low dose ALM resuscitated the heart, and away she fires. The membrane potential is, is at its resting voltage, and, away, and uh, it, it kept, just kickstarts. It's not like an old Victor lawnmower with high potassium. So um, the idea was applications of trauma and uh, our, our capability gaps in tactical combat casualty care is that uh, they, there's an, a need for um, uh, small volumes, high potential resuscitation. 87% of deaths in, these, uh, in the battlefield occur from mostly hemorrhage and hemorrhage and TBI in the first 30 minutes before they can get to a, a medical treatment facility. So this is, uh, uh, and uh, they believe that 25% um, um, that, uh, that of them are potentially salvageable, and that's what we're, that's what we're working with. So 91% are bleeding and 20-odd uh, percent are, are hemorrhagic uh, and, and TBI. So our whole idea is that it's the, it's the old uh, canon uh, philosophy of homeostasis. You, you want to help the body help itself. And it's not, worth, uh, it's not about putting three or four litres of, of fluid in the patient and shocking them a second time. It's about bringing the mean arterial pressure from a shock value to a permissive state whereby you get enough oxygen to the brain but you don't pop the clot and die. So Haley is giving the next talk talk gave a, uh, we, we added 7.5% sodium chloride and we thought it might be good for traumatic brain injury down the track, and it is, uh, with adenosine lidocaine magnesium. We did studies where she took about 40% of the blood out of the animal, and, uh, and what we found is that when you do a little bolus of the uh, ALM, it resuscitates uh, the, uh, the animal into that hypertensive zone. So that's in blue, we took, we took out eight mils of blood from the animal to 40%, it's a rat. And uh, we only put 0.8 drops to resuscitate. So military, they like that. And uh, so traumatic bleeding occurs from two ways. One from the, uh, the bleeding from the vessel, and the other is the blood gets thinner because of the trauma. Same thing with traumatic brain injury, it gets thinner. So you start to bleed out, and that's called traumatic-induced coagulopathy. The ALM corrects that as well. It blunts inflammation, I'll show you that in a minute. So with a Rotem in the left-hand side, that's the control. The 60 minutes, the, uh, sorry, in the middle is the control. Can't clot. The blood can't clot after 60 minutes, whereas ours comes back and that, that occurs after five minutes. So we correct the coagulopathy within five minutes. Now, uh, translation to the pig. And this, uh, we did this in Denmark. Haley did this. We took 75 per cent of blood out of an animal. And we put uh, 120, 160 mil back and we resuscitated and, uh, and led to increased survival. Now, the work we're doing with the US Special Operations is uh, now we're doing cutting the liver, so it's non-compressible. That's the, the bleeding internally. That's the issue. And so what we showed is increased survival uh, and uh, a 60% reduction in blood loss in the, in the cavity itself, the abdom abdominum abdominal cavity. So we believe that is due to, could be to correct any coagulopathy. So it's like an internal tourniquet. The last study we did with them, it's just published in September issue of Journal of Trauma, we actually monitored them out three days for survival. And all the ALM survived uh, three days. We give them a bolus and then wait 60 minutes and then a drip for three hours, four hours. And so they all survived three, three days and controls died after a day. How does that occur? Um, we, after five hours of treatment and you've got three days, you've got a survival phenotype. You're switching the animal to a survival phenotype. How does that work? We're looking at the number of key um, genes controlling metabolism, particularly the mitochondria, and uh, we've found that the, it's differentially expressed. The brain and the heart are full-blown uh, 
activated, whereas the periphery is, is, uh, is down-regulated, just like a hibernator. So the, um, the end game is a, bo a, a small um, bolus for the first hit. We give them a bolus, we wait 60 minutes, and then we do a four-hour stabilisation drip, and they're the two solutions that we're developing for 2026. We'll also resuscitate their dogs. And uh, so the hemorrhage of the TBI has been told. You've got the primary injury, not much you can do with that instead of headgear or thing, but it's that secondary uh, ripple effect that really the ALM is, a, is, go, is Taylor's going to talk about addressing uh, in using exactly the same dose as what I just showed you in hemorrhage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeffrey. You lost Haley. Oh. It's right a short pause. Let me talk amongst yourselves. Ask, ask some searching questions. I can make the questions. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So if anyone has any questions for Jeffrey yeah. while he's up on the stage. Please. Yeah. You, you talked about uh, putting the, the injured person into a survival mode. Yes. But you didn't talk about how you get them back we don't know that. We, all we can do is take them for three days and we're just, put, we're just getting a grant now to see if that survival mode lasts for seven days. Because when the, in the special operations they get stuck in a certain place for safe evacuation, three days was their magic number, but uh, the future conflicts they, they're worried about being there seven days. So uh, we're, we're going to extend that survival phenotype. So we, we don't know when that switch occurs. It could occur an hour after we give the uh, after we give the, the, the bolus and the, the drip. So that it's a very interesting uh, because not only does it reduce inflammation, not only does it uh, correct coagulopathy, um, and Haley is going to show you that it protects the brain as well. Oh, here she is. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I thought last year I thought I was going to give you a talk. Thanks, Jeffrey. <laughs> so. No, no worries. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce the last speaker, so Dr. Haley Leston from the Heart Trauma and Sepsis Research Lab at James Cook University. My apologies. I've had a little bit of vertigo the last few days and it's, yeah, it's very uncomfortable. I'm sure anyone who's had it knows. Um, so now that Jeff's given an overview of our small volume ALM um, fluid therapy, I'm just going to present the results from um, our first study where we evaluated the ALM therapy in a model of um, moderate traumatic brain injury in the rat and also a, um, a potential neuroprotective effect we found in an uncontrolled hemorrhage model in the peak. So I apologise, I know it's the end of Monday, it's, I'm going to tr try to make this not too scientifically based. So um, as Jeff said, um, we're funded by um, US Special Operations Command and traumatic brain injury has become a key focus area um, for the US military in recent years due to its increasing incidence. So they estimate that about 20% of all returned servicemen and women have experienced at least one mild traumatic brain injury. And the change in weaponry and widespread use of IEDs led to traumatic brain injury being recognised as the signature injury of Operation Iraqi Freedom in Iraq and Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, um, as was mentioned today in the keynote address. So sadly, we're now seeing the devastating consequences of TBI in those returned servicemen and women. So there's mental illness, there's cognitive deficits, there's PTSD, and there's early onset dementia. So um, for this study, which was funded by Special Operations Command of the US military, we used a lateral fluid percussion injury model of experimental traumatic brain injury. So in this model, you have um, an anaesthetized animal, in this case, a rat. Um, they're attached to a stereotaxic apparatus to undergo a craniotomy. So we drill a 4.8 millimetre hole through the skull, um, midway between the bregma and the lambda, and four millimetres lateral to the sagittal suture, which runs down the middle of the skull. So we do that to cement a lure lock, which is seen here in blue, and that's then connected to this fluid percussion device. Releasing the pendulum here results in a rapid fluid wave being driven against the dura overlying the brain, and that produces an injury with both focal and diffuse characteristics. So we get changes in blood flow, increased blood brain barrier permeability, um, hematomas, ischemia, um, the whole hammock of um, TBI symptoms. 
So the pressure of the fluid wave is recorded on a digital oscilloscope, and we can actually adjust the severity of the injury by adjusting the piston that the pendulum hits and also the angle and the height of the pendulum. So um, this was an acute study, so these animals were anaesthetised and ventilated for the entire um, experiment. Um, they received a moderate traumatic brain injury of 2.57 atmospheres of pressure and 15 minutes later they were randomised to receive either no treatment or a 0.7 mil per kilo fluid bolus of hypertonic saline or our ALM therapy. 60 minutes later they received no treatment or a low volume intravenous strip of the normal physiological saline or ALM and we monitored them, oops, sorry, we monitored them for a further three hours um, under anaesthesia. We had sham animals, so these animals undergo the craniotomy, so the surgical instrumentation without the, the brain injury, and they received identical fluid treatment to our saline control group. So we used this um, OxyFlow ProXL laser Doppler tissue monitoring system to measure brain blood flow um, during the resuscitation and monitoring periods. So this sensor here, that's placed into the cerebral cortex through the lure lock. Um, we use a sterile needle to create an opening in the dura mater. And what we found was that the ALM treated animals had a threefold increase in cerebral blood flow within one hour after brain injury and significantly higher cerebral blood flow throughout the entire experimental period compared to the, all, all the other groups. Now that's important because in a healthy brain, the cerebral blood flow is tightly controlled to ensure we've got an adequate supply of oxygen and nutrients. And we know in traumatic brain injury, there's an initial reduction in cerebral blood flow that results in hypoperfusion, hypoxemia, can cause that secondary injury that we've been talking about and lead to worse outcomes. So by increasing the cerebral blood flow, the ALM was preventing neuronal death and potentially protecting the brain against that secondary injury. So we also found that the ALM therapy significantly reduced the levels of a brain injury marker called neuron-specific enolase, or NSE, in both the brain tissue and in the peripheral circulation. So NSE is a marker of um, neuronal injury, so neurons are our, our brain cells, and um, we know that high levels of that are associated with unfavourable outcomes in um, TBI patients. The ALM also reduced secondary injury by preventing inflammation. Um, so we, had, um, we measured inflammation both in the brain tissue and in the peripheral circulation. And we know that that inflammatory response associated with traumatic brain injury contributes to things like cerebral edema, the elevated intracranial pressure, the ischemia and the hematomas. We also found that pro-inflammatory infiltrates, not just the brain that's affected from a traumatic brain injury, but pro-inflammatory infiltrates were also significantly reduced in both the heart and the lung tissue of the ALM treated animals. And not only did ALM attenuate the production of the pro-inflammatory markers, it also led to an increased expression of anti-inflammatory cytokines, IL-10 and IL-4 in the brain. So um, I think it was Alistair maybe was talking before about that balance between the pro and the anti-inflammatory. And so what we're seeing here with ALM is this reduction in neuroinflammation early after brain injury, and that may help improve outcomes. So cardiovascular complications are also very common after traumatic brain injury, and they're associated with increased morbidity and mortality. So we use, in our small animals, we use trans echocardiography and ultrasound, and with that we're able to show that ALM improved cardiac function, and that was indicated by a 3.7-fold higher cardiac output and 2.4-fold higher stroke volume. We also know that hyperthermia is particularly dangerous in TBI. It can cause secondary brain injury by increasing vascular permeability, promoting that cerebral edema and inflammation. So in this study, we found that ALM maintained a stable, mild hypothermic state of 33 to 34 degrees Celsius compared to our saline controls and, and untreated animals, which experienced temperature increases up to 38 degrees Celsius. So we, we believe this is part of that slowing down of metabolism um, that Jeff talked about. 25% of the saline control group and 33% of the untreated animals died due to cardiac failure. So it was quite a severe um, injury. Um, and that's similar to the in-hospital um, mortality that you get from acute cardiac dysfunction post-TBI in humans. So it's early death. Similar to our other studies in models of severe hemorrhage, cardiac arrest, surgery and sepsis, we showed that the ALM treatment corrected coagulopathy, which is this dysfunction of the blood clotting system, and preserved the platelet function. 
So that correction of coagulopathy, we show that both with, um, I think I heard Jeff as I ran out talking about the rota, and we show with both viscoelastic whole blood clot analysis, as well as these plasma-based clotting tests, prothrombin time and activated partial thromboplastin time. So TB, another thing we know about TBI is that it, um, it causes uh, platelet hypofunction actually within minutes after injury. And it's suggested that by preserving platelet function, as ALM um, is showing in this study, may be key to actually preventing secondary injury in that first eight hours after TBI. So traumatic brain injury often doesn't occur in isolation, especially um, when, you, when you're dealing with the battlefield. So we've got polytrauma is really common, and TBI is often accompanied by hemorrhagic shock. And as Jeff mentioned, we've been studying the effects of ALM in hemorrhage for many years in both rats and pigs. So this is a, a, a pig model of uncontrolled hemorrhage induced by laparoscopic liver resection. So we place these laparoscopic ports in the abdomen. We then use carbon dioxide to insufflate um, the abdomen and attain a pneumoperitoneum that enables us to isolate the liver. We then use this modified laparoscopic instrument with this deadly scalpel blade on the end of it to resect part of the liver and then the animals bleed internally uncontrolled. So this is a non-compressible hemorrhage. You can't use a tourniquet to stop someone from bleeding internally. Again, we have sham animals, so they have all the surgery, but they don't have the bleeding. And in order to monitor the brain function and metabolism, which we'd become quite interested in with the ALM, um, we, we created two burr holes over the top of the, the parietal over the skull to insert three brain probes. Um, so we had uh, the OxyFlow Pro Excel system again, that was for cerebral blood flow and PO2. We also measured uh, intracranial pressure um, with the raw medic system that also measures PO2 and temperature. And we had a microdialysis catheter in there to measure the brain metabolites, which were mentioned in the talk a couple of talks ago. So um, basically, this was a model where um, we cut the liver, we let them bleed internally for three hours, uh, not for three hours, sorry, for 30 minutes. Um, and then we gave them a four mil per kilo fluid bolus followed 60 minutes later by this low volume drip. Again, what we're trying to design this drug to be is to be useful in a pre-hospital environment. So a bolus that can be administered very quickly by a combat medic, by uh, a, a first responder in a remote place. And then you've got this 60 minute period where you can get them to a helicopter, to a medical treatment facility to start a low volume drip. These animals also had, um, had blood transfusion because it was a hemorrhage, hemorrhage model. So the survival over six hours was 100% uh, for our ALM animals and 80% for our saline controls. Um, as you would expect, so the mean arterial blood pressure fell significantly during the bleeding. What we found was that administering the um, hypotonic saline bolus, a 3% NACL, which is sometimes used in traumatic brain injury, as well as a 0.9% saline drip, it increased the saline mean arterial blood pressure to 62 millimetres of mercury, whereas we had this steady fall in the ALM group. Now this permissive hypertensive resuscitation, which we love in um, hemorrhage, um, is really usually typically contraindicated in a setting of traumatic brain injury, where you want, um, you want a lot of blood flow going to the brain. We also found, associated with that low mean arterial pressure, was a significant reduction in cerebral perfusion pressure. And if there's any clinicians in the room, they're probably going to be freaking out seeing this slide because basically we were dropping the cerebral, oops, sorry, we were dropping the cerebral perfusion pressure down to 45 to 32 millimetres of mercury. That would normally indicate that you don't have enough flow going to the brain and you're going to risk secondary injury progression. Interestingly though, what we found was that the brain was actually protected at these lower perfusion pressures and the lower systemic map, and that was indicated by significantly lower um, brain expression of lactate and glycerol, those metabolites that we measured. So glycerol and lactate, they're both ischemic biomarkers. They both indicate secondary injury progression. So what we think we're, we're doing is reducing the, the actual cerebral oxygen demand. And, and we did a sort of a, a, a bit of an arbitrary measure, measurement based on a carotid blood flow. We had a probe on the, carotid, on the carotid artery which enabled us to estimate that we had lowered the cerebral oxygen demand in the brain. And so what we're, I guess the overall goal here is if you can reduce the, the demand of the brain when your supply is limited, then you're going to prevent all of that ischemic damage and hypoxic damage. And just finally to finish off, so obviously that was um, 
we were quite happy with the results that we got from that um, acute study in the moderate traumatic brain injury. Obviously, we really want to do a conscious recovery study and we want to do cognitive assessments as well because the, the animals were never woken up in that study. Um, we'd also like to study, obviously, repeated um, traumatic brain injury. So repetitive mild TBI is uh, a huge problem for the military population, but obviously also has been discussed today, sports-related concussion, um, domestic violence incidents, um, repetitive TBI, mild TBI is one of those key, key focus areas that we need a lot more research in. And finally, we, we are also interested in um, that the expression of these signature genes, tau, amyloid beta, that may link TBI with later um, age-associated neurodegenerative disorders. So there's a lot we'd like to do. In the, we're very new to the TBI field, but there's a lot we'd like to do, and, and hopefully we'll be able to keep going and maybe come back another time and present something further. Thank you. Thank you, Hayley. So, um, our special gift to all of you, the audience here, is we've now got 20 minutes with um, an expert panel of clinicians and researchers um, open for questions from all of you, um, and we will find the right expert <coughs> to answer for you. So if anyone has any questions, we do have the microphones going around. Testing, testing. We're there. Good afternoon, doctors. Um, you're talking about um, acute stages. Um, is there any study into, like, like I've had my accident was 12 years ago. Is there any um, investigation into, like, long term, like, any treatments? Well, probably uh, it's aimed at Alistair. Is there any benefit of taking that uristoprotin? Nope. Is that better? Yeah. Yep. Um, so um, the answer is yes and no, like everything. So um, our studies use a primary endpoint of six months. So that's pretty early. And um, a significant amount of the improvement happens by that time but by no means all of it. So at the moment, uh, that study I talked to you about, the, the first study we did, the EPO-TBI, was published in 2015. We're actually currently following up all of those patients now who will actually be um, five to nine years after their primary injury and actually assessing what their um, levels of disability or what their function are and what their problems are at this stage of the game. So the answer is there have been some studies that have looked at long-term outcomes, but there haven't been a whole load of studies that have looked at the effects of an intervention um, many years later. And the problem in ICU, I suppose, is we are reasonably myopic and we look at the short term, and that's a function of the studies we do. But because we had a signal and we thought there was something of benefit of this, we have started to study people five to nine years later to see are, the, um, are there are there any of the benefits you see, are they getting bigger at that stage? So um, the answer is not all studies, but some, and it's definitely an area we have to look at, especially if we see any, any benefit. Thank you. Epo, well, you know, you're getting a lot of trouble for that, for starters. Um, <laughs> um, the, it, no, so no, no, the, the honest question is, um, my academic hunch is that, that EPO might be really beneficial, but I don't know for sure. And like everything we do, there's a potential for harm. So before we would sit with our other colleagues and say, hey guys and girls, this is something you should think about, we want to have all of the evidence so we can have an honest discussion. And I think as Andrew said, there's an opportunity cost. When you spend money on anything, you take money from something else. So you want to be sure it has a benefit and um, it's unlikely to cause any harm. So thank you. Uh, 
Hi, um, um, I'm Michelle and I'm from Brisbane and I was just wondering, did you have any idea about how or who did you thought about there being another mechanism of action for the erythropoietin? Oh, um, so, 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 so the answer is, um, so th this was used commonly, so blood transfusion is probably not good in intensive care and all our APOTBI study was the only study that looked at some of these other mechanisms. Everything before that had assumed that any benefit was because it improved the amount of red blood cells you had. You therefore didn't need bags of blood hung, and that would be good. But surprisingly, for us, the doctors, the, the, even when you got APO, if you were sick in the ICU, you did not need more bags of blood. So that was not the way it worked at all. And that started this whole other line of research into what other mechanism it might be. Um, and we are just starting to tease that out. So there are two groups which I briefly talked about. Um, the injury that appears to be diffuse, like so all over the brain after the injury, and the people who have major trauma concurrently seem to be the two groups who are most likely to benefit. But I'm not sure if it's just a general protective and sort of restorative effect generally, or if there's some specific marker. And that's part of a nest study we will do in this to see if it does work, what the actual mechanism is. Thank you. Yeah, so do you want, here, let me give you this. Just whoever else can hear you. Sorry, I, I just want to congratulate you all, and I think it's very exciting um, what you're working on. Um, my family was involved in a car accident 21 years ago, and three of us were in comas. Um, two were on life support and taken off life. I, luckily, I wasn't on life support, but my two sons were on life support, and we took them off life, life support when I came around. <laughs> um, my husband was trying like he had to make the decision what to do so he would be like um in that position um when i came around then um we made the decision to take them the boys off life support they both survived um one died 10 months later w without ever regaining consciousness and the other one um is now 29 years old um but he's still got severe. He walks and talks and has taken years to learn how to do everything, but he he's still not, um, still has many problems and won't ever work. But um, yeah, I just like, I just think it's really exciting what you're working on and um, wish you all the best. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to make a quick comment and then a question to follow up. I guess the quick comment I would make is that, um, as I think you can see, we're very proud of the conference we put here and, and organised because it, it's an opportunity for experts like us to actually meet members of the community and it's really quite important. And so thank you for sharing your stories here with us. It's a great opportunity for us to really mix together in this meeting. And like I said, it is a little bit unusual, so it's, it's great for us as well. I guess my question to the panel is um, about knowledge transfer. So there's a lot of research going on in this space in terms of looking at how we improve, particularly in this case, acute responses to a traumatic brain injury. How are we going to work together to ensure that we have best practice in place and that we're constantly updating that? And then I guess the, the nice thing now is that there's a national strategy around this that Lindy's in charge of, no pressure. <laughs> Um, how are we going to bring all that together, guys? And I guess, you know, where do you see the, the challenges but also the opportunities? Well, I was going to say the best person probably to answer is Lindy. Uh, <laughs> is Lindy. I mean, I think, think the Mission TBI and, and the Vision TBI really gives us the platform to have this conversation. Um, you know, in the same way that we're talking about concussion clinics, uh, you know, statewide across Australia, I think we're also talking about trying to um, standardise intensive care, uh, both from a monitoring point of view, uh, delivery of um, or administration of, uh, of novel agents like erythropoietin or maybe ALM, uh, 
and, and trying to bring everybody on the same journey and have the same agenda. Uh, so that because, because it is important that we have, I think, um, we work together and we're not siloed uh, because uh, we want to try and make sure that uh, we, we, we do get these ideas into clinical trials and then into clinical practice as soon as possible. If I could just add to that comment that um, I totally agree and I think historically there's perhaps been groups of, of really high, um, high level um, clinical trials and, and clinical trauma centres that are operating at this great level and it's not necessarily the case in all states of Australia and it's certainly not the case in remote and regional uh, Australia and so I think what we need to try and do is level the playing field and make sure that we get um, the best evidence base that we are able to run clinical trials in a consistent fashion across the country so everyone has access to the best um, potential tr um, therapeutic strategies. If we can do that, um, the, the field has been kind of riddled with um, long running trials that have taken a very long time because they're run in a few small centres and there's been problems with recruiting enough people. So it might take seven years to run a trial and then it's negative. So what we would like to do is to run clinical trials across Australia and not only that, internationally, so that we actually run the same trial internationally. I just came back from America a day ago and um, where I was at the International Traumatic Brain Injury Research sort of consortium where the Europeans and the Americans and the Canadians and, and now us are working, going to work together so that the, the dream is we can actually run a trial a year. So we can actually go through and, and really more swiftly get to the stage where we can identify what um, practices will work and then disseminate that information. I think the mission's got a huge goal to be able to um, disseminate that information to clinicians as well uh, in all states of Australia and, and there's potential for real impact internationally as well. I'd just like to add, uh, you know, we all have to realise that there's a graveyard of uh, clinical trials out there. There is no effective, safe drug to treat that secondary injury progression that we talked about. And I think that that's the one area that I think needs some attention is thinking about what model you use to translate from the basic science to the, to, to the clinical situation. Um, and uh, we've done some work, uh, Haley and I, on uh, the, the gut microbiome. And uh, that is absolutely essential to talk to the brain with respect to the right model and the right response. For example, in uh, mice that, are, that, are, that have a specific pathogen free, um, they've shown that the immune system is not, is, doesn't duplicate humans. So I think in that consortium that uh, was talked about, I think you've got to really be careful about what animal model you choose and what the microbiome is. Uh, is, is uh... He's always putting his hand up. He is, isn't he? <laughs> oh, we've got a few more questions from the audience. <laughs> Um, sorry. No, I just wanted to say when you said about the community, it's great that the community are here today for you guys to listen to. That's fantastic. If anybody wants to talk to me about my TBI, um, I'm available. Like You can come and ask questions because hopefully we help the next generation. And I think that's where we are with TBI. So thanks, mate. Thank you. Really, thank you. G'day, um, my name's Hannah, I'm an OT from Newcastle and uh, I work in the community with people who have acquired brain injuries and uh, some of them are, have very severe brain injuries and um, as a rehab clinician I often am frustrated at the really poor outcomes that I can achieve with those clients and Jenny Ponsford is talking this morning about how there's so much evidence missing on the other end of the spectrum. Um, and I wonder, do you ever worry that you, we might be able to have people live, survive these catastrophic injuries, but still we don't have the infrastructure to support really positive outcomes at the other end? Uh, well, certainly, at a, from a, speaking as a clinician, it's probably one thing which I spend ninety percent of my time thinking about um, when I'm at the end of the bed uh, of a patient who's got a severe traumatic brain injury, um, thinking about uh, the quality of life, um, whether that is going to be consistent with 
what they deem as an ex acceptable healthcare outcome. It's a lot of time uh, in conversation with family, um, a lot of time uh, just consi you know, considering and talking about options and, and pathways and, and the journey uh, that is traumatic brain injury. So um, I, I certainly have a lot of anxiety as an acute care clinician about uh, the quality of survival. And that's why I think when uh, Alistair and I have talked, we've often talked about functional outcome as a primary uh, outcome. Certainly I think uh, mortality and surviving is not just the be all and end all. And it's very much about trying to generate um, people that can uh, return to work, uh, can still get enjoyment out of a lot of the things they used to do before the TBI. And, and we, we really, um, we want to look and make sure that the interventions will improve patient-centered outcomes, so improve the way pa patients think and feel, uh, not just in terms of survival. Other, other than your uh, contact with uh, uh, with the research animals, are you uh, thought about working in conjunction with the veterinary profession? Um, because there are quite a few studies coming along now with our, um, now that we're getting MRIs, etc., into our profession. Uh, and Haley, um, will your conscious recovery? How will your conscious recovery study go with the animal ethics? Uh, work. Um, animal ethics is something that I'm very passionate about and um, I'm actually a serving member of our animal ethics committee so um, that's why we always start with an acute study where animals are anaesthetised and, um, and ventilated and monitored. Um, Jeff alluded to this before, there's a very fine line in getting the right model and you know being able to translate to a human outcome. We can't actually model human traumatic brain injury exactly perfectly, we never will be able to. Um, so the thing with the conscious recovery is making sure that there's, there's certain guidelines in place that we need to make sure we've got um, post-operative analgesia and monitoring but in terms of a lot of studies that have been done with that sort of conscious recovery. Um, when I've been over at the Naval Medical Research Centre in the US. Um, so they've done that, that model that I did, the fluid percussion injury model um, on, on pigs as well. So when they get, they, they monitor, it's, it's like having a veterinary patient, so they're monitored um, over time. Um, in terms of, um, so actually I'm actually quite excited, all of the pig studies I've ever done I've actually had to go over to Denmark, which is a long way to go from Townsville um, to do those and um, for the first time we've, we're doing our first toxicology studies in pigs and we're finally working with our own veterinary school um, to do those and our own vet hospital and using their services. So um, yeah, it is something that we're engaged with. On the veterinary side as well, so um, Special Operations Command, so they have um, the canines that they use and basically we work with the vets to actually get the ALM trialled in the canines, the bomb disposal dogs and the dogs that come out of, out of planes and stuff like that. So because to those soldiers, those dogs are just important. They're, they're considered sentrymen to them and so um, they want the same treatment for their dogs as they want for themselves, so yeah. Can you please thank Lindy, Alistair, Andrew, Geoffrey, Haley, and Roger.